along with a printed transcript. And um, in terms of self-care, you know, we ask that you do whatever you need to do to participate in the session today. Um, in person, we would invite you to move around or knit or fidget, take notes, draw, um, or just listen. And uh, virtually we will invite you to do the same. And we will also invite you to have your cameras on or um, off as uh, you're comfortable. Um, although it is helpful um, for the interpreters if you do have your camera on, um, if you are speaking. Um, participation uh, can be, uh, you can use the raise hand feature um, on the Zoom controls. You can type a question or a comment into the chat box. Um, or you can um, uh, um, speak out loud um, when the time comes for questions. Um, you can also feel free to communicate with Kat or myself asynchronously um, via email. Um, again, one more reminder to please mute your microphones if you are not um, actively speaking. Um, and um, we also just want to acknowledge that accessibility is really an ongoing process and um, there are often competing accessibility needs. And so it's something that we constantly learn from and, and, and um, we, we wanna try and, and do better um, each time we do this. So if you do have any recommendations, please let us know. Um, and without further delay, um, I will introduce our two speakers. Um, so um, Anat is going to be presenting first. Um, Anat's the director and founder of the Tasker Center for Accessible Technology, um, which is housed here in the University of Washington um, Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. Um, she's also the director of translation for CREATE. And um, Anat is really interested in exploring ways in which um, collaborative um, commons and cooperation can challenge and really transform um, assistive technology um, and um, incentivization of rapid development and deployment of um, ethically built accessible technologies. Um, and her research focuses on engineering machine intelligent solutions uh, for customizable and real-time responsive technologies in the context of work, play, urban street environments. Um, and uh, that's what she's going to be talking with us about today. Um, our second speaker is going to be John Freilich. Uh, John is an associate professor in also in the Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering and he is an associate director of CREATE as well. Um, John's research focuses on designing, building, and evaluating interactive technology that um, addresses um, social issues such as environmental sustainability, um, computer access, and uh, personalized health and wellness. And he um, has been recently working on um, real-time captioning and sound awareness support uh, for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. And he's also working to combine remote crowdsourcing and artificial intelligence to identify and assess sidewalk accessibility. And um, we're gonna hear more from him about that today as well. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Anat, uh, who's going to um, present for um, about 20 minutes. We'll switch over to John, who's going to present for about the same, and then we'll um, bring everyone back together uh, for questions for both Anat and John um, to end our session today. Um, so without further ado, Anat, I will turn it over to you. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. I need to make sure I can share my screen. Perfect. Hello. All right. Thank you so much. So um, thank you, CREATE and Dr. Feldner and Dr. Steele for inviting me to participate today. My name is Anant Caspi. I'm a tired looking brunette woman wearing glasses and a gray sweater. And I speak against an artificial background which has the logo for the Transportation Data Equity Initiative, uh, which is a recently funded five-year project um, at the Tasker Center for Accessible Technology, which uh, Heather has already introduced for me, so I won't reintroduce it. We are part of the Paul G. Allen School for Computer Science um, and Engineering. Uh, and really since 2014, access to mobility and transportation has been a focal point for the TCAT organization. And particularly this past year, oh, are you seeing my screen still? <laughs> 
Um, particularly uh, this past year, we've seen so many different cracks in our social systems that have and still are having a lot of um, implications and leaving many people behind. And so by November of 2020, organizations like Fair Health and even the CDC were publicly recognizing that people with disabilities often rely on complex networks and a host of services and different supports in order to stay in their home and community environment and these systems were crumbling during state lockdowns and really still a year later are still remaining compromised. And so current assessments about the impact of the pandemic on people of all ages um, who have disabilities as well as their family members has shown that in the US, we are really failing this population on very, on many fronts. Uh, whether it's having unthinkable public discussions about healthcare rationings that threaten civil rights of people with disabilities, or labeling people as disposable members of society, or removing and reducing public transport um, and paratransit options for people who have no mobility alternatives outside of that, or even in providing few resources for students with disabilities to adapt to widespread school uh, closures. Um, there's just ample research that has shown um, that all of these were impacted and are still reeling from that impact. So the question that remains for us to ask today is what can we look forward to from here? Um, and how do we, you know, the, the statement is build back better, but really in an area that was fraught with so much inequity to begin with, we really have to aim to build, rebuild without reinforcing those prior inequities. So what I wanted to do today is take a little step back um, and understand the backdrop to this building back or rebuilding because we are not starting from scratch. Um, and in fact, transportation systems were already undergoing huge changes that are going to transform cities, transform society. Um, and all of these were prompted by a number of different forces at play. So one is increased environmental awareness. A second is rising life expectancies, households working longer, millennials in the workforce. Um, and different socioeconomic forces that were coupled with advancements in technology that really brought about changes in, in mobility that are driven by social networking, location-based services, as well as wireless services and cloud technologies. So all of these together are, were already contributing to five concurrent mobility innovations that together I'll call new mobility. Um, and the image I just brought up shows a person's hand holding the world in hand with spokes moving away from the hand pointing at different innovations. And the five concurrent mobility innovations that I wanted to point out are first automation. So we know vehicle automation is coming and there's a potential to create new and exciting opportunities for public and private sectors. Um, and potentially this might be cost saving. Uh, you can think of automated pickup, drop-offs, charging more economical and convenient ways to um, do paratransit or demand responsive services. So um, those are, that's just one innovation. A second is electrification. So using electric drive vehicles that use one or more um, traction motors for propulsion and therefore reducing greenhouse gases. Um, a third is shared mobility, uh, it, enabling users to really gain short-term access to different transportation modes on an as-needed basis. So this is very much parallel to paratransit, which has been very costly in the past. And so shared mobility is an ecosystem of shared transportation services, and it continues to grow and includes a whole array of different services. So a potential there to increase the modes available to people. Um, a third is digital fare payment integration. So the ability to pay for all travel services with one regional card is a transformative change that we've experienced um, before and part of the new mobility. 
And lastly, and importantly, our on-demand and app-based mobility services for an array of different transportation choices. And so this last piece, the on-demand app-based access to information has really given travelers unparalleled access to information about different modes, different multimodal decision-making is now put in the hands of travelers. So a traveler can make a decision based on a variety of factors like cost, journey time, wait times, number of connections, convenience, all these different attributes. And there's digital information systems in their hands to help them put all of that together. You don't have to go out and seek all this information everywhere, which is uh, time costly and people used to do that. And so these innovations have really made multimodal travel and public transit a lot more discoverable, more convenient, and more easily available for personal decision-making uh, with dynamic and real-time information in the hands of people. So basically, rather than making decisions between modes, mobility consumers can now decide among modes and basically chain all these parts of their trips together, putting together a complete trip. So this kind of traveler-focused tooling um, that includes mobility and wayfinding applications are transformative. And needless to say, um, it has been fraught with inequities. And that is what I'll explore today. But I wanted to mention the other four because all of these transformative changes are fraught with inequities that impact people with disabilities and older adults. But we should also be clear that those are not the only populations that are inequitably treated through these innovations. There are disadvantaged um, people who have been previously traveled to disadvantage and are also left behind by this new mobility. You can imagine automation if an autonomous vehicle is not designed to accommodate all kinds of travelers, that's inaccessible. Electrification has been um, a, a lot of uh, notable challenges and um, affordability questions arise with electrification. Shared mobility likewise has uh, shown that it is um, not accessible to all across uh, socioeconomic um, and a variety of different users. And also there are issues with where they are left and whether they are blocking the right of way. Um, and likewise, digital fare payment integration has also um, not been applied across the field. So only scheduled and route mobility has uh, thus far been integrated into these systems. So basically a lot of people are being left behind. People with disabilities are one group of that. People living with rural or within suburban environments, people who experience difficulty accessing pedestrian environments, people who cannot drive or cannot use or don't have access to private vehicles, uh, people who use on-demand or paratransit or eligibility required transit options, all of these populations are being left behind. So if we were to take the equity, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> if we were to uh, consider the equity lens and apply them to each one of those, um, we would have a lot of work to do. And so what, although at TCAT, we were initially focused on that last one, the on-demand and app-based mobility services, and that's the story that I'll be telling you about in the following slides, each and every one of these innovations is just rife with inequities and opportunities for bringing in the equity lens to ensure that we modify these transformative systems to make them more inclusive for more people. And although I'd love to um, go into exactly what those opportunities are. It'd be great if um, you reached out to me because <laughs> there are many and there are not enough hands um, to do the work. So I now flip the slide and the image shows a screenshot of an itinerary planning application that's showing multiple choices for mode navigation. And that includes bus, rideshare, metro, shuttle, light rail, but it doesn't include pedestrian or on-demand or paratransit travel. And as we noted, these kinds of multimodal navigation apps have really given travelers an unprecedented ability for discoverability. So you can easily find the information you need. You can be conveniently directed to those transit services through these apps. 
Um, you can also include unplanned serendipitous travel uh, because you can just go on the app if you're somewhere and identify the information you need. You can compare different travel options and you can filter those travel options by looking for personal travel preferences that you want to compare um, across the different potential routes. And this is not just transforming travelers' access to information, which is obvious in these apps, but also how people actually use and experience public transit. And so many populations that already had travel disadvantages cannot benefit from these applications in the same way because they are missing crucial information that's really relevant to their travel. So there's this significant information gap that doesn't give everybody the same visibility on every part of their complete trip. So um, what is going on here? Well, behind every useful mobility application and really behind every useful civic tech app, there's a very complex data pipeline. And it provides centralized, reliable, and intuitive recommendation and directions, um, which public agencies or private companies, whoever is producing the app can share that data and then add on additional tools to provide people the visibility and the comparison that they like. And the image I'm showing has a circular pattern with travelers of all kinds in the center of the circle. So it's traveler focused. And around the circle is a layer of data about all kinds of modes of travel. And the ones with blue background, which is like one third of that, of that pie, um, already has this data standardized and the collection mechanisms exist for it. So this includes public transportation information, like I said, all the scheduled bus route system and light rail and things like that, um, as well as road network information. So a private vehicle can navigate through those roads. Those are really the two types of data that power these applications like Google Directions, Movil, Apple Maps, etc. So beyond that, there's an area of the circle with gray shading, and these includes mode of transport like micromobility, fleet, and ride sharing. And so you can jump in, um, and if you want to do work on this right away, <laughs> you can join these communities that are currently working on standardizing and already have open data about these modes because the operators of these micromobility services have data that they, some of which they expose to the public. So for example, if you want to make uh, an impact, you can join these uh, groups and make it standard public up practice to publish where those scooters were left in the middle of a sidewalk somewhere, because right now that's not regulated. And so if we standardize that practice and also standardize the level of accuracy that we expect these operators to collect about their micromobility devices, we can essentially create policy around how fast they need to deal with these things and send somebody to move them from the public right of way. So um, that's one way to join in this, the fun of um, addressing equity in the new mobility. Uh, the last area is a purple background area, and that um, has to do a, a, about integration of data about other travel modes like paratransit, um, like pedestrian infrastructure, so sidewalks, as well as different stops and stations. And currently data about these is almost completely absent. Specifically, uh, no standardization exists with respect to sidewalks and pathways through stations. Um, and these provide really integral links that collect, connect all modes in the complete trip together. Um, and the established new mobility data infrastructure has not focused on these at all. Um, really anybody who has access to personal vehicles and fixed route transit is done well by these applications, but anybody who requires additional information about the two thirds of the pie that's left over here is kind of left out to dry by, by these applications and they're not really being addressed. So if you're not a data person, what could you possibly do about this? So as I mentioned, first you can join uh, like open mobility data organizations. Um, it's also important to weigh in on regional transportation plans that regional mobility policy organizations are constantly putting out there for like public response. Um, and there are other avenues to advocate for transit agencies to adopt good practices. 
Um, and one example of what we've done is recently co-authoring the mobility data interoperability principles, which brought together a host of different travel agencies and municipalities, nonprofit organizations, and transit providers to drive policy changes in the area of data sharing and really um, foreground equity lens in the creation of this mobility data. So it's not just about publishing the stuff, it's ensuring that the data attributes themselves are pointing out equity um, issues or at least are addressing those in some way. So basically combined, we have to use both carrots and sticks to promote the use of a common infrastructure to collect, share, allow access and allow search of travel data. So I've spoken actually for longer than I thought to get to this point, uh, but if you're a technologist, what can you do? So I'll just really ram through some of what TCAT is doing and hope that um, you'll be pique your interest enough to uh, ask about how you might collaborate with us in the future. So um, we started on this path, this journey uh, of providing customized trip routing just for pedestrian ways. Um, and we created a somewhat sophisticated router called Access Map, and it's initially was a web app. Um, it's been in operation since 2017. And last Friday, we launched the um, a mobile app for both uh, Android and iOS. And it's a custom pedestrian routing application that allows people to personalize their needs about elevation changes, use of indoor elevators, um, looking at curb ramp requirements, as well as marked crossing. So um, Access Map is really truly city scale because you can search over the entire city and it centers the lived experience of a person experiencing inaccessibility in pedestrian environments because it allows for total customizations of the preferences. So we do provide um, some canonical, you know, um, uh, power wheelchair or uh, manual wheelchair travel modes if you're if you want to take a shortcut and trust us that the average manual wheelchair is similar to your preferences but you can also entirely customize the experience for a different version of the ui um, and a, a different mobility model we foregrounded the experience of people with visual disabilities and this is a different version that really looks at stair avoidance preferences, controlled crossing preferences, or how controlled you want your um, crossing to be. Do you want to completely avoid yield signs because that's not safe? Um, and other um, priorities that people with visual disabilities indicated as important for their travel. So uh, you can try those versions for yourself, but what was hard about creating these applications was actually not what we expected at all. So we were, we created a dynamic map, we calculated accessible routes, we were able to create these personalized mobility profiles that interact with the cost functioning behind the routing. Um, the challenges were really in having good, reliable data to support this and specifically about cities sidewalk infrastructure. And this is something that um, both John and I have been working on separately, um, but also trying to collaborate in the coming future about how to create standardized ways of looking at this data. And so the abysmal state of pedestrian data, both in lack of standardization and consistency throughout cities was just terrifying. Um, and so with TCAT, we started the Open Sidewalks Project in order to overcome some of these challenges um, and in order to be able to scale and build other access maps with other types of UI, being able to foreground other personal lived experience of um, individuals with disabilities. So this really presented the opportunity to use policy, technology, and community engagement hand in hand to generate data for sustainable and resilient communities. So a lot of our work uses computer vision and robotics. I will totally skip the <laughs> video that's showing how we construct the pedestrian graph. Uh, but I will just say that, you know, downstream applications don't start and end with personalized routing. You can also offer dashboards to cities to understand what does walking really look walking and rolling really look like in your city so here we're showing our sidewalk score tool 
Um, and again, using that same exact data that we use in Access Map Mobility and Access Map VI, we're foregrounding the different experiences of, in this case, canonical profiles to show that, oh, okay, a person who is using a powered wheelchair in this area um, might be able to get this far with 400 um, meters of travel starting at the purple point. If we uh, restrict them to widths of two meters on the sidewalk, so this is for um, social distancing, not, to, not implying that two meters is needed for somebody to travel through the sidewalk, this restricts their travel quite a bit more. But having that kind of data is really informative to cities who are trying to plan and say, are we going to plop a new transit station here? Are we going to um, put, uh, decide that this is a better street for um, slow streets versus this one? And then being able to change out the different modes of travel, we're also able to assess how well does a manual wheelchair traveler uh, you can use this environment and is it more inaccessible to this individual versus the power wheelchair before. So really highlighting different inequities in the same travel environment is what you're able to do with these data. And so um, the transportation data equity mission is really to look into more um, additional data standards to uh, put into this interoperability um, yeah, infrastructure, and aside from the creating the data formats, actually create the tooling for collecting these types of things. So a data collaborative approach to our accessible cities um, includes supporting the development of these standardized collections, promoting policy and evaluation frameworks that really looked at traveler centric data as opposed to like how well, how many cars do we move through, through the street and improving civic data and tools for cities to openly share data so that they can actually do what we're asking them to do. And with that, I will finish and um, I think we'll take questions at the very end. So I'll, um, transition over to John. Great. Thank you so much, Anat. If everyone wants to join me in giving a brief round of applause, she is correct. We will save the questions till the end. Uh, so uh, now, uh, Anat, if you want to unshare your screen, we will switch over to John. And Heather and I are keeping track of questions in the chat too, so feel free to type them in. All right. So Dr. Freilich, turning it over to you. <laughs> oh, so kind of you. Can you all see my screen and can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so hello from my basement in Seattle. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, as Heather nicely said, I'm a professor in computer science at the University of Washington. And my talk today is on crowd plus AI tools for sidewalks. I'm a white middle-aged man with increasingly gray hair. I'm wearing a purple Allen School hoodie and a black Dub t-shirt. Dub is our sort of local organization at the University of Washington focused on HCI and design. Um, and feel free to use chat during my talk. In fact, that's a good reminder for me to open up the chat. Um, there will be one, at least one interactive activity. So, uh, but at, at any point, feel free to put in questions. I saw Yohai asked uh, a not a question earlier. So let's get started. Sidewalks are a critical form of public infrastructure. At their best, they provide a safe off-road pathway for pedestrians, help interconnect mass transportation services as a not nicely articulated, and support commerce and recreation. The problem is city streets, sidewalks, and even businesses are not accessible. There's a lack of curb ramps, or you might see scenes like this, physical barriers that can beat and impede access like poles or incomplete sidewalks, surface problems through uplifts or weather degradation. And in the worst case, an image or scene like this, multiple physical impediments and poor sidewalks um, leading to unsafe conditions and inaccessibility. This has significant negative consequences as captured by one of our interviewees. When I go to school in the mornings, I don't take the sidewalks. I actually take the street and they shout at me from their cars. They're like, get off the road. And it's like, I can't actually use the sidewalk. But the problem is not just a lack of accessible sidewalks, but also a lack of data. As the US National Council on Disability notes, 
there is no comprehensive information on the degree to which sidewalks are accessible. And as a not noted, there's also no standard methods for sidewalks and sidewalk accessibility either, or open data standards. And of course, this problem is not just unique to the US, but is endemic across the world. So my group is pursuing a twofold complementary solution. First, to develop massive scalable data collection methods that mine online map repositories to identify street level accessibility problems using a combination of machine learning and crowdsourcing. And second, to leverage this data to enable new kinds of urban accessibility visualization and analytic tools. Our overarching vision is to develop crowd plus AI techniques to map and assess every sidewalk in the world. And we've been working in this space for a long time. For example, let's go back to 2013. Here we began building and studying our initial crowdsourcing systems. We asked, can minimally trained crowd workers find and label sidewalk accessibility problems in streetscape imagery? To address this question, we iteratively designed and developed an initial crowdsourcing system comprised of a labeling interface and a verification interface. Here's a demo of the labeling interface. Your job is to find and label all sidewalk related problems. In this case, there is a fire hydrant in the sidewalk, so you draw an outline around it. Outlines are drawn by clicking around the identified problem to set outline points, with a final click at the original point to complete the shape. When the shape is complete, you select the appropriate label. In this case, we select object and path, and then mark its severity. Severity is a five point scale where the far right is most severe, indicating not passable and the far left is least severe, indicating passable for wheelchair users. Here, we mark five because it is clear that a wheelchair user could not get past this fire hydrant. As you label these images, please know that there could be more than one problem in an image as shown here. You should try to label all problems in each image. Our user interface and labels were informed by the US Access Board ADA guidelines, formative interviews, and the research literature. For example, in this video, a person in an electric chair uses an initial prototype to rate accessibility problems, which we compared to crowdsource data. Okay, definitely this utility pulls an object in path. Okay, object in path. I'd say that's a five. For our crowd worker experiments, we deployed our tools to Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is an online crowdsourcing marketplace. In all, we hired nearly 400 users who completed thousands of tasks. Crucially, we found that while it took 35.2 seconds to label an image, it was over three times faster to verify an image. With a single labeler per image, accuracy ranged from 85% for the sidewalk ending category to 73% for the object and path category. I'm showing actual labels from our study on my slides. Here are some results comparing quality control mechanisms. The y-axis is labeling accuracy, higher is better. And the axis, x-axis is roughly time or effort cost, which increases from left to right. So with one labeler, we get an average accuracy of 81%. But we get a significant accuracy boost using three verifiers and only one labeler, and an accuracy of, of nearly 93% with three labelers and three verifiers. So this work demonstrates that with basic quality control measures, minimally trained crowd workers can find accessibility problems with an accuracy of 93%. Still, our approach relied purely on manual labor. So can we do better? So next we began exploring, how can we combine crowd plus AI techniques to improve efficacy? Our first system in this space was called Tome. Tome semi-automatically detects curb ramps in Google Street View imagery by combining crowdsourcing, computer vision, and machine learning. Tomei's automatic curb ramp detector scans a sliding window across an image and attempts to automatically find all curb ramps. But the detector is imperfect. While it finds some curb ramps, true positives, it also incorrectly labels other areas as curb ramps, so-called false positives. So the next stage in our pipeline sends these automatically labeled images to a crowd verification interface. Where the, simply, where the user simply clicks on incorrect detections. I'm now showing a video demo of a user clicking on these incorrect detections. And this verification task is much faster and easier for crowds to perform. Once again, to evaluate Tome, we ran experiments on Amazon Mechanical Turk. We recruited lots of people who did many tasks. And again, we found that verification is much faster than labeling alone. 
In initial crowdsource these experiments, we found that Tome achieved similar accuracies as manual labeling alone, but increased overall sidewalk assessment speeds by 15%. This was promising. So this research and more culminated in Project Sidewalk, a web-based crowdsourcing tool for collecting sidewalk accessibility data at scale. It's a publicly deployed tool. You can visit the website at projectsidewalk.org. And in fact, as part of the Reimagining Mobility series, we'll be hosting a Project Sidewalk Mapathon tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific. Project Sidewalk combines online map imagery, remote crowdsourcing interfaces for labeling and validation, and machine learning to scalably map and assess sidewalks. Let's take a look at a demo. With Project Sidewalk, online crowd workers are given game-like missions to label and assess sidewalk accessibility. This is a lot like an immersive first-person video game. We're going to label a surface problem. We select the surface problem label, we click on the problem, we rate its severity, and then we en enter open-ended descriptions. Now we're going to label a curb ramp, and at that same intersection, we discover that there's a missing curb ramp, even though there's a crosswalk. We can also label obstacles and path. For example, this fire hydrant and this pole, both which are severe impediments, and also label missing sidewalks. The key to this is that it's remote crowdsourcing. Anyone can participate. You just need a computer and inter internet connection. I'm showing a picture of a boy labeling Mexico City from Germany. Project Sidewalk has two types of game missions, exploring and labeling and validating and correcting. As you saw from the video, each time a user labels a sidewalk feature or barrier, they supply a severity rating, an open-ended description, and optionally add tags. There are five label types and 37 tags in total, and we work with our partners to adapt these based on their needs. Each label type has their own kind of specific tags. For example, here I'm showing the obstacle tags, which include trees, fire hydrants, parked cars, and more, all of which can impede the use of sidewalks. In addition to labeling, we also again have these validation missions to an improve and ensure data quality. So this is the interactive part of my talk. This is what a validation mission screen looks like. And you might get a screen that says, well, is this a missing curb ramp? So I want you to ask yourself, is this a missing curb ramp? Is this label type, that red little circle there, correct? And we're going to try something new with Zoom. Uh, to voice your opinion, you can use the green check mark if you believe this is a correct label and the, the circular red X if you, if you want to mark disagree. So that's on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. You can click on that, and I think we'll be able to see everybody's vote. So for example, Kat has already voted that she believes it's correct. So we can see if there's any wisdom in the crowd. So, so far I'm seeing all green check marks, which is great. I, I agree with you. There's sort of a faded cro crosswalk here, uh, and, and there, there's clearly no curb ramp, uh, to, to access this sidewalk, not to mention the other components of having stairs and other things. Yeah, so we to simplify all of our missions, it's, it, that would be an additional validation screen. So Kat and chat asked, well, what about those stairs? And those are clearly impediments too, but that would be an additional mission screen. So we try to simplify everything for our crowd, crowd workers. But let's do a couple more. So similarly, this intersection, um, there, uh, there's a crosswalk and someone labeled that there's a missing curb ramp. Do we agree with that? Again, you can, your votes will continue to persist over time. So that's one thing uh, that might be problematic here is you have to like uncheck and check again if you want. So I agree, this one is also uh, a correct. So we would mark agree. Um, how about this one? This is a blue label type, which means obstacles and path. So is this obstacle and path label correct? Yep, this one is from Washington DC. You have two poles, utility poles here, clearly blocking the sidewalk, agreed. How about this one? Here we have a surface problem label um, on grass that is nearby a sidewalk. All right, so far we're batting 100%. So that's, that's great. I, I would disagree with this. This grass is not uh, a sidewalk impediment. The sidewalk is a bit narrow, uh, but this, this grass is off the pedestrian pathway. How about this one? This is an uplifted sidewalk panel next to a tree, a very common problem actually in Seattle. However, this one is from one of our Mexico deployments. Yep, you're right, agree. I think I have maybe one more. How about this pole? 
Is this an obstacle? So this is actually one of our most common problems is we ask people to you know, label poles that are physical impediments to um, mobility. Um, and so sometimes people will just like label all poles, uh, not fully realizing that you know, there's a pedestrian zone oftentimes, and then there is a street furniture zone for things like trees and utility poles. So we also try to make projects. Thank you for participating in that. <laughs> First time doing the Zoom interactions. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy that. Thank you. You can stop disagreeing or agreeing now if you want. So we also try to make projects that work fun and educational. We use game design strategies to reward achievements and divide work. We have things like leaderboards, which are particularly fun to use in our educational contexts and mapathons. And um, we have interactive onboarding to train users into the tool itself and sort of some of the guidelines on sidewalk accessibility features. And we also have a step-by-step -step labeling guide. So let's take a look now at some of our deployments. So in 2017, we launched an initial pilot in Washington, DC, and over 1,400 users participated, providing 260,000 labels with 92% accuracy. And to explore patterns in sidewalk accessibility, we can visualize this data in a variety of ways. For example, the map shows DC streets colored by a street accessibility scoring algorithm that we created. But a lots of other visualizations are also possible. Here we're showing data as point maps where the lighter areas represent higher label counts. With these visualizations, spatial patterns of sidewalk obstacles begin to emerge. So I want you to really focus in on that obstacles map there. And you might notice these two hot spots. So we can identify these inaccessible hot spots as I've done in these highlighted areas through this point map. Uh, another visualization that we've explored is what's called an aggregate problem density heat map. And here, I would argue that these problematic areas become even more salient. Here, bright colors correspond to more problems. One bright spot corresponds to Anacostia, a lower socioeconomic area that is 92% Black, and our findings suggest has poor pedestrian accessibility. But another bright spot, interestingly, corresponds to Georgetown. And if you're familiar with DC, you know that this is a highly affluent area that is 82% white, but has historic infrastructure like cobblestone pathways and preservation policies that perhaps come at a cost of accessibility. So these are the source of insights that really demonstrate the power of data-driven analytics using project sidewalk data. Let's dive into this a little bit more. Since our pilot deployment in DC, we've worked with partners and NGOs to deploy project sidewalk into seven additional locations, including two in Mexico. Over 10,000 users have contributed nearly 650,000 labels with 235,000 validations. We believe this is the largest open sidewalk accessibility data set in existence. All of our data and tools are open source, so others can build on our work. For example, a developer built an interactive tool visualizing sidewalk accessibility data in DC from Project Sidewalk Data, which received local press. Here's another example called GOAT, which is the Geo Open Accessibility Tool, which also in integrates project sidewalk data. Uh, but you can too. Our API supports common standards like GeoJSON, which is easily imported into online tools like Cardo.com, which I'm showing here. I want to return to some of our deployment sites to highlight how Project Sidewalk has been used by community advocates and municipalities. First, with Newburgh, Oregon a city an out, hour outside of Portland with a population of about 24,000. In Newburgh, we were contacted by and worked directly with the local government and community advocates to map and assess sidewalks. Over 230 users participated, completely mapping and assessing 187 kilometers of streets. Most excitingly to us, the Newburgh City Council passed new sidewalk accessibility and repair policies based on project sidewalk data. Now let's turn towards our first international deployments, which are in Mexico. In Mexico, we worked closely with an NGO called Liga Peatonal to deploy Project Sidewalk to two cities, San Pedro Garza Garcia and Mexico City. Each city represents a different type of partnership. In San Pedro, we partnered with the local government and schools, while in Mexico City, it's more grassroots and volunteerism based. In our work with San Pedro, they wrote a letter of support stating, Project Sidewalk provides us with the data that is essential to improving San Pedro's urban accessibility. With Project Sidewalk, we know the main problems to be solved how many problems there are and their location, the results will be used to inform a new pedestrian master plan for our municipality. Liga Peatonal helped us create a Spanish language version of our project sidewalk website, including all of the interface features. And I have a little video demo here of uh, moving about in Mexico City with the Spanish language version, but I'm afraid 
we'll have to skip past it due to low time. Thus far in Mexico City, we've collected 32,000 labels in a single neighborhood. And in San Pedro, we've collected over 100,000 labels and completely audited the city. Project Sidewalk also has built-in visualization and analysis tools. For example, we can use the label map tool to filter this data by label type and severity. Here are all the obstacle labels in San Pedro visualized as blue geolocated point labels. And here are all the missing curb ramps. There are thousands. If we only look at missing sidewalk labels, we could see that, for example, the mountainous and more peripheral edges of the city systematically lack sidewalks. Recall that we also ask users to rate the severity of identified issues on a scale from one to five, where five is worse. So let's go back to the all obstacles. So these are all obstacles found in San Pedro. And here are the ones that rated are rated as most severe. Similarly, here are the most severely rated curb ramps. Because our technique is image-based, we can actually click on these dots and see the underlying image. For example, here is that label. And it is a narrow curb ramp with a pole obstruction, which is certainly a severity of five. We can also look at severely rated curb ramps together and identify patterns. For example, the most problematic curb ramps in our two Mexican cit cities are too narrow, steep, or contain obstacles or fundamental design flaws. To help support this type of qualitative analysis, we recently built and deployed a tool called Sidewalk Gallery, which takes all of these image labels together and makes them available to you through a fil filterable gallery. You could try it at sidewalkgallery.io. It's this interplay between quantitative and qualitative analysis that we think is so powerful with a technique like Project Sidewalk. Okay, so we've gone over a lot of our work. I wanna talk a bit about the future and a few discussion points. So first, our techniques rely on the availability of Google Street View. Google has captured Street View imagery across 83 countries, 10 million miles, but there's a notable lack of coverage in Northern and Central Africa, large parts of Asia and Russia, which is an unfortunate limitation. Another common question we receive is about the age of Street View images. We know the capture date of all Street View images and show it in the bottom left-hand corner of our interfaces. So for example, this image was taken in July 2019, while this one was taken in June 2019. Interestingly, we found that the average age of our imagery is about 1.5 to 2 years old, and this was the same both in the US and in Mexico. As a point of comparison, the official opendata.dc.gov curb ramp data set was captured in 1999 and last updated in 2010. A second important discussion point is how to support data-driven advocacy. And my PhD student, Manaswi Saha, has been creating and studying a variety of different types of urban accessibility visualization prototypes and evaluating them with different stakeholder groups. We've just begun new collaborations with the City of Chicago and the University of Illinois Chicago and the City of Amsterdam to explore how our tools can inform urban planning, engage civic participation, and affect change. A third discussion point relates to where do Project Sidewalk users come from and how to sustain participation. We have found that the key is local committed partnerships, either with community or governmental organizations. For example, Liga Peatonal has been particularly successful involving schools, and we're very excited about the future of service learning curriculum using tools like Project Sidewalk in the classroom to help students and children learn about urban design, disability, and civic participation while contributing valuable data. Fourth, now that our data sets have grown to over 600,000 labeled images, we can experiment with new labeling machine learning techniques not previously possible. And we recently published a paper showing that some of our deep learning techniques are almost as good as human-based uh, validation for things like curb ramps. Finally, we're hoping to enable and support new urban science questions, such as what are the geospatial patterns and key correlates of, of sidewalk accessibility? What do sidewalks look like across cities and countries? How does accessibility vary and why? In closing, I invite you to join our efforts in using Project Sidewalk to map and assess sidewalk accessibility. You can follow us on Twitter or visit projectsidewalk.org. And again, I'll be doing this mapathon um, uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. I want to acknowledge the many wonderful students and collaborators who've participated and uh, contributed with this work including Kotaro O'Hara, who started this as part of his PhD dissertation, Mikey Sogstead, who's the lead engineer and data scientist, Manaswi Saha, who is a PhD student graduating this year, focusing on data-driven uh, advocacy tools for urban access. I also wanna acknowledge our partners and our funding sources. 
Um, finally, if you're interested more in our work with Mexico City, Liga Pantanal in the, um, recently published this report in the United Nations Habitat Program that came out actually just recently. Um, and then next week, Anat Caspi and I are involved in a 90 minute panel at the Spatial Data Symposium, looking at the future of global scale spatial data collection and analysis for urban inaccessibility. You can also learn more about our work at the Makeability Lab website. And again, here's the advertisement for the Mapathon tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, John. Please join me in giving him a round of applause as well. Thank you both so much um, for this awesome, awesome uh, look at your work. Um, we, I'm not, we have a few minutes for questions, so I'm just going to dive right in to um, some of our questions in the chat. And, and uh, if anyone else has a question, please feel free to either put it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I'm going to start with a question from uh, Patrick, um, and it was, um, he was specifically asking, John, how might a city go about becoming a deployment site? Um, the Center for Independent Living, for which I work, has been doing in-person sidewalk hazard identification, but we've struggled with data aggregation, and your system seems like an ideal solution. And so really, to both John and Anat, how do folks get involved, more involved in um, your crowdsourcing work? John, do you want to go first? Yeah, that's a great question. I think... Um, we have found that it takes a uh, deep commitment from local partners. And so we have, and I'm happy to share it. I have to pull it up. Um, we have a webpage that talks a lot about this for, for people who are interested, either community groups or local governments about what it might take to bring Project Sidewalk to your community, because ultimately it does take a lot of effort. Um, regardless, even if it's either on the ground sort of walkability audits or, or you're doing it virtually, it does require sort of a concerted effort by, by lots of people. So I'm happy to share that link, Anat. Yeah, so um, actually <laughs> we just uh, heard that we will be funded for the next 100 cities uh, with Microsoft's AI for accessibility. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a certain bar to entry and <laughs> it's not very high, but part of it is about local engagement and having advocacy groups involved because uh, a huge part of our, so to speak, toolkit and engagement kit um, is about having local stakeholders owning the data um, and also informing our process because uh, with open sidewalks, we actually don't collect the same kind of data in every city. Different localities have their different priorities and concerns. Like for example, in Seattle, uh, people that we, you know, our co-design efforts led us to um, map indoor infrastructure because people use one level to enter, take the elevator up and leave the other way. In um, Twin Cities, Minnesota, people are really concerned about the skyways. And so these are very different local concerns that uh, we want to foreground with advocacy groups and people with disabilities on location. Um, so that's important. Um, the other part of the bar is having some uh, modicum of data to begin with. So we can seed some of our machines. All right, I think, unfortunately, she froze on my side. Yep, I think same. All right, of course, uh, she's probably being, saying we're about on time. Well, and so then I'll ask just Hannah's question too real mm -hmm. quickly, uh, which is, and if a knot comes on, she can answer it too. But John, do you have a sense of what percent of people who are participating are individuals with disabilities or how they are connected to the community? Yeah, I think that's a real essential question. It comes up um, many times when we, when we share about Project Sidewalk. Um, and you know it, it's of critical importance. We don't collect any real demographic data. Sometimes we do pop up little surveys to our Project Sidewalk users, but it didn't, doesn't ask them about their identity or their mobility. Great. Well, we are at time, so I do want to respect everyone's time. I know that I get so excited thinking about these tools, and you know, as a mechanical engineer and biomechanist, like thinking about how we can link this um, with a lot of the tools that we have in our toolkit as well. Um, so unfortunately, it looks like I'm not had to drop off, but if you all can join me once more in thanking John. Um, also, like you mentioned, tomorrow, same time, same place, literally the same link. Uh, if you want to come and join the Mapathon, learn how to use Project Sidewalk, contribute. Um, we really are excited and hope that some of you or invite your colleagues if you want them to come and get hands-on experience with Project Sidewalk as well. 
we'll be back here and we hope that many of you uh, will join us. John, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think it'll be fun. It'll be pretty informal. I think we can use the leaderboards to sort of track and, and, and see where we are. We're, you know, we're in multiple cities, um, some of which are, are not actually linked directly on the Project Sidewalk site. So for example, we are in Chicago, but we're planning on doing some audits in Seattle and some of the Northern or Southern neighborhoods. Perfect. And Anat is back on. Anat's Sorry, back on. Anat, you uh, froze, but uh, thank you, thank Anat, you so again. Much. Did you have any closing thoughts, Anat, that you wanted to add on since you're back? <laughs> Uh, no, just for those interested um, in additional policy driven efforts, um, let us know. Contact us as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We hope you all have a great day. Thank you to Tammy and Teresa, our interpreters, and uh, we look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.